to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of pain written on your face bearing the awesome weight of sin every bitter thought every evil deed crowning your blood-stained brow this the power cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath we stand forgiven at the cross. Daylight flees. Now the ground beneath quakes as its maker bows his head. Curtain torn in two. I feel like the music this morning has said everything that is in the message, so uh, being on this end of the preparation of it, I just, the music just screams to me the, the truth of John chapter 8, so I hope that you'll be able to make those connections uh, with the songs that have been sung this morning. We're going to go ahead and dismiss the children at this time. Four years old to fourth grade, you can head on out. As they head out, if you'll grab your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John, John chapter 8. This this passage of Scripture in John chapter 8 is a wonderful illustration of the beauty of how righteousness and holiness are brought into agreement with mercy and grace. Human wisdom has no answer or ability to bring together holiness and righteousness with mercy and grace. And we see it in the hypocrisy of the Pharisees who who would who would champion the holiness, or at least say they would champion the holiness and righteousness of God. Or you can see the opposite end where the people of Corinth championed this idea of graciously including people who are involved in gross sin. The shortcomings of man's ability to deal with sin 
is obvious. Our, be- our ability to harmonize these two polarizing aspects of holiness and sin and mercy and grace. Even amongst Christian circles, there seems to be a polarizing struggle between what some would call legalistic judgment, judge not, or fleshly tolerance. Come out from among them and be separate. There seems to be this pull, and yet these shortcomings or the shortcomings of men always glorify the beauty of Jesus Christ. Today, I'd like to see from our time in the study of John chapter 8, how, as said in that beautiful passage in Psalm 85, how righteousness has been brought into a relationship with peace. Righteousness and peace, it says, have kissed each other. And so if you look with me at John chapter 8, we'll start reading in verse 1, and we'll read down through verse 11. It says, And Jesus went up into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted himself up, and saw no one, no none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Interesting passage of Scripture where Jesus is thrown into a situation where Well, by the Pharisees' hope, he would be caught between the rock and the hard place. And Jesus, in great wisdom and understanding, offers to this woman what he has offered to us. And I would pray that as we go through this, this morning, that you would find yourself standing in the place of this woman. And you'll see why as we go through. First of all, I want us to see here the the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. If you've been with us as we've been studying through John, the Pharisees hate Christ. They hate Jesus Christ for who he is and what he claims to be. They are so they 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 are so knowledgeable in the scriptures and yet so ignorant to its truth. And as they see Jesus claiming to be God himself, they want him dead and they have been plotting now for some time to kill him. And this is, as we come to John chapter 8, this is just another, another opportunity to try to get him, get him in trouble with authority, and, and, and to get him out of the, the sight and minds of the people. And yet, of course, because God has a perfect plan in place, they cannot succeed. And so, I want to see this morning their hypocrisy. The Pharisees are those who study the Word of God. They're supposed to be the religious leaders of Israel. They should, they're the ones who have... Uh, by profession, the most knowledge of God and, and are on a higher level, they would call themselves holy. And in fact, they would call themselves so holy that they would go through great lengths to avoid contact with commoners, much like yourself. They wouldn't touch them. They didn't, they could, servants could be in the house working, but they had to be out at certain times, and they, didn't, they couldn't touch certain things, and they were never to touch their... I mean, just crazy ideas about how these... Pharisees would maintain this idea of holiness, and yet they are Pharisees. And, and, and we use the word Pharisee as a synonym of hypocrisy. Because, in fact, they did not 
no God. What is God's attitude toward adultery? I think it, in this context here, we would be wise to stop and say, okay, here's a woman that is caught in adultery. What is God's view of adultery? We sang songs this morning about the holiness of God. What is God's attitude toward adultery? Well, let me read it to you, and you're welcome to turn to these passages. We'll hit them very quickly. In Exodus 20, chapter 13, you have the Ten Commandments. And in the Ten Commandments, you have this in verse 13. Thou shalt not kill. Right? And the next verse says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. God prescribes grave consequences for adultery. As, as the law is laid out, Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10 gives the penalty in Israel for those caught in adultery. Leviticus 20 and verse 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And stoning was the way. The Pharisees are championing the holiness of God, are they not? As they bring this woman caught in adultery to Jesus and say, What should we do? The, the law, which we just read, the law states that she should be killed. Well, in these verses, it teaches us that God's attitude toward adultery is this. God hates adultery. You can't get away from it. You can't get away from it from the Old Testament scriptures, even from the wisdom literature. Let me read for you in Proverbs chapter 6, which speaks about this. In Proverbs 6 and verse 27, it says, Can a man take fire into his bosom and his clothes not be burned? What's the obvious answer? No. You try holding some fire sometime. Verse 28, can, can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? And then it gives us the wisdom. It says, so he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whatsoever toucheth her, shall not be innocent. And then it gives us an analogy. It says this, men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house, right? So, so we recognize that, that when people are hungry, they'll go to great extents to, to get food. But then it takes it to the other side and it says, but adultery is not the same. Look what it says next. Verse 32 of Proverbs 6. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He's an idiot is what this is saying. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and a dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. For jealousy is the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. Unlike theft, which can be repaid, adultery cannot be repaid. Just as a man who would pick fire up and take it into his chest, so this man will receive great scars. God hates adultery and has set before us in the, in the aspect of human nature that adultery will harm a person. And whether or not you have seen those aspects of adultery, it is true. God has created life to work this way for Christian and non-Christian alike. Does Jesus change the Old Testament law, though, in the New Testament? Does this story of the woman caught in adultery somehow trump or go over God's hatred of adultery? The answer is absolutely not. In fact, Jesus not only takes the law of God and reiterates it in the New Testament, he actually drives it much deeper and more personal. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus takes the physical act of adultery, which, as we have just read, will harm those who are participants in, but he takes it and he drives it to a very personal level. Listen to what he says. Ye have heard that it was said before... Excuse me, you've heard it was said by them of old time, 
thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, Jesus is taking a position above the law. He says, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Jesus says the true danger of adultery isn't only seen in the fact that it will harm relationships. The danger of adultery is that your heart has been pulled away from God. And it is adulterous to lust. Even if you don't participate in the actual act, you are guilty of adultery. God hates adultery. It goes against his created institution of marriage. It violates his character of steadfast love and commitment and loyalty. It destroys homes and relationships. It violates trust. And Jesus does not nullify the law in this story. He intensifies the law beyond outward conformity, driving it to the issue of the heart is not just an outward act. A person can commit adultery in the heart. Not only this, but as you read through the prophets of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Paul, and Jesus himself, they all use adultery in a spiritual sense When Israel or professing believers follow after other gods, and what is the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And when Israel would depart, he would call that adultery. God hates adultery. Jesus condemns adultery in word and in deed and in the heart. And so it almost seems like the Pharisees are justified. They're godly because they bring this woman and they say, ha ha, she has violated the very character and nature of God. But but there's some inconsistencies, aren't there? Think about it. The Pharisees' passion for the holiness of the law was just a smokescreen. They didn't care one bit about the following things. They cared nothing for purity right? If they had cared for purity, they would have also brought the man. Where's the man? These men did not care about the holiness of the law. It says that they, 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 they took great care over small things of the law, but totally disregarded the purpose of the law, like justice and equity. Even though They would invoke the law against this woman. We know that they did not care about the intent of the law based on how they're going about it. Right? Why did they come to Jesus? Jesus was a rabbi in a sense. He was a teacher. He was not a judge. He was not one that could pronounce in a sense. And of course he can because he's God. But as they viewed Jesus, he couldn't pronounce judgment on this woman. They needed to take her to a court. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, it had to be proven that she was in adultery. And then the court, the justice system of the day, would give the judgment. They should have taken her to the Sanhedrin. Rabbis had no power to make binding judgments like this. Verse verse 6 tells us, what motivated the Pharisees, right? John chapter 8 and verse 6, this they said, tempting or testing that they might have to accuse him. I'll tell you what, this is the beauty of a, of, a, of a blameless life. When they came to Jesus, they had absolutely nothing that they could hold up as legitimate criticism. And so they spent their time just trying to trip him up with, with doing right. They bring this woman so that they can hear what his judgment would be so that somehow in his kindness to even take time to deal with this situation, they could trap him. Reminds you a little bit of Daniel, right? Daniel was of such blameless character that the the, the king's counselors couldn't catch him on anything. And so they said this, we've got to create a law about prayer and then we're going to catch him as he prays. That's exactly what happened. This is the strength of a blameless testimony. They couldn't hold anything against Jesus. He kept the law perfectly. The motivation of these men is only self-serving. They want to trap Jesus between two damaging alternatives. They they, they want Jesus to claim a side. So, Jesus, do we stone her? I don't know if they were holding stones or not. 
Or Jesus, what, do you give her mercy? They didn't say that, but that's the insinuation there or the implication. If they could get Jesus to disagree with stoning her, they could claim that he was guilty of violating Mosaic law. Ah, you call yourself from God, but you don't uphold his holiness. You don't uphold the law. You're a false teacher. But if they could get him to agree to stone her, his teachings and actions of compassion towards sinners would be inconsistent and in a sense hypocritical. Or, or maybe he would, maybe by taking the life of somebody, they could then run to the Roman government and say he's a murderer. He allowed this. They just want to catch him. They want to trip him up. They have no concern for the woman, for the man, for the situation. They have no care for the holiness of God. They just want to use it for their own benefit. And by the way, that is what hypocrisy will do in our lives. We'll take that which we would find on our side and use it. Use it to promote ourselves. Inadvertently, though, the Pharisees bring out a much deeper issue. The Pharisees bring up a much deeper issue about the character and nature of our God. How can God hold two seemingly opposing attributes in perfection at the same time? How can God be holy and hate adultery and talk about the consequences and warn against the consequences and actually drive it even deeper into the, the, the issue of the heart and then be merciful and gracious? How can a God do that? And in turn, then, how can we take the right course of action when we are faced with these kinds of dilemmas, whether they be in our own life or family life, community, what is to be our action? God is holy. Adultery is sin. A transgression of God's law and nature and character has happened. And since the law comes from God, according to Romans 712, it is good. The law that forbids adultery is good. The commandment, it says in Romans 712, is, is holy and righteous and good. But the law cannot forgive. The law only picks up stones. The law cannot forgive. The law can only condemn or prove innocent. The soul that sinneth, the Bible says, it shall die. The law brings about the wrath of God. So then, how can Jesus say in verse 11 of this passage, neither do I condemn thee. And let me just say, there's a whole aspect of what people would call Christianity that would latch onto this as a, well, Jesus has just said that we are not able to take a position against sin like the Old Testament law has. We must accept it. Who am I to judge against the sin of adultery? And that is wrong. And we're going to see it here in this passage. For Jesus to say, neither do I condemn thee, does this violate God's holiness and God's attitude toward marriage in adultery, God's law, which is good and right, an intensified action of the heart, is, is Jesus being inconsistent and hypocritical himself? And so as we see this conflict, as we see this, you know, like the Pharisees hoping to work this out and make him choose a side, what they forgot was that this is Jesus Christ. And I want us to see the beauty of Jesus Christ in this struggle. And the first point of Jesus, the beauty of Jesus is this. Jesus absolutely condemns adultery. Absolutely, Jesus condemns adultery. How? How did he condemn adultery? Look at the passage. Look what it says. After he had written in the ground and, and, and the, the, the Pharisees and those around were convicted in their conscience, one by one they leave and and Jesus lifts himself back up and seeing nobody says, Woman, where are thine accusers? I'm not one of them. She said, No, no, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Where does Jesus condemn the sin? I'll tell you where he condemns the sin. He came to earth. The Holy Son of God becomes flesh as a baby in the manger. And he condemns the sin by living a perfect life. 
Living out the law, Jesus fulfills the law in its completion. No one could hold the law over Jesus' head and say that he had transgressed it. Jesus lived the perfect life. This is how he condemns adultery. And then he dies. He hasn't done it yet, but he is going to die on a cross for this woman's adultery. That is how Jesus condemns adultery. The soul that sins, it must die. Sin must be punished. God is still holy, and his holiness must strike at adultery. But as the song said, that's the power of the cross. Christ became adultery for us. Right? The sin had to be condemned. Jesus by dying on the cross for this woman, condemns this woman's sin of adultery in the flesh by suffering the wrath of a holy God, not for his own sin, but for hers. And let me just say, for yours, for mine. The wrath of God against the hated act of adultery was put on Christ, and Christ was crushed for it. This is amazing. Jesus did not in any way excuse this woman's sin. No, he took it. And he took it in its full, its full rebellion against God and his holiness. And Jesus suffers the taking the fire into the bosom. Jesus suffers the penalty of adultery for this woman, which is death. And he condemns sin. He condemns it. Take, I, I, take your Bibles with this context in mind and turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Think about what he's doing for this woman. Think about what he is doing for you. By condemning sin, Jesus offers a life of no condemnation. Listen to, we would call this the doctrinal explanation of what Jesus is doing that day with the woman. Listen to how the doctrine works out, right? Romans 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. I do not condemn thee. Go and sin no more. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit is life in Christ Jesus. And it's made us free from the law of sin and death. The soul that sinneth it shall die. God hates adultery. You must die. Oh, but there's the spirit of life. And because Jesus condemns sin in his flesh, look what it says in verse 3. It's so beautiful here. For what the law could not do. What could the law not do for this woman? The law could not let her go. The law could not release her as free. The law could not bind up her broken heart. The law could not give her a garment of praise in her shame. The, the law could not give her the, the joy of gladness or the oil of gladness. She should have the garment of mourning. But what does it do? It puts on her the robes of Christ's righteousness. For what the law could not do in that it is weak through the flesh... God, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for the sin of adultery, condemn the sin of adultery in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in this woman, in you. You see, the truth is you can take any sin from your life and substitute it for adultery, and the story goes the same way. And he condemns that sin in his flesh what the law could not do, God did by sending us Jesus Christ. Look at verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit do mind the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and what? Peace for those who were weak in sin. Peace for the adulterer. Peace for the thief. Peace for the liar. Peace in Jesus Christ. 
Listen, the beauty of Jesus Christ is found in the fact that Jesus condemns adultery. But he does it in his own flesh that we might have what he earned, righteousness. And I tell you what, it is absolutely unjust to punish the righteous. Those Pharisees who thought they were righteous stood in a place of great condemnation because they refused true righteousness. We'll see that here in a minute. Jesus in no way excuses this sin. However, instead of leaving us in our condemned state, he takes on our condemnation. So the question may come up, how do we know if this woman put her faith in Christ? I, I don't know her heart, but I'll tell you, there's an interesting thing to observe in this passage. Look at verse 6 of John chapter 8. John chapter 8 and verse 6, something amazing happens here. This, they said, Moses says she should be killed. This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued to ask him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, except for one, right? There is one who did not walk away because of the condemnation of their conscience. Who was it? It was the woman. You don't think she had opportunity to leave? As all of her accusers are heading out, she is in great shame. But she doesn't use that as an opportunity to sneak out the back. Her life was in jeopardy. And as her accusers left, she did not run out. She stays. And I think it says something to us that this woman did not leave and Jesus looks up and says, where are those that condemn you? Look at the difference between the Pharisees and the woman. Though we don't know what Jesus wrote in the dirt, I've always thought that he, sat down, he was in the dirt writing everybody else's sins. I don't know that. I've heard people say that he was writing designs to stall them, to give them time to think. I don't know, but I tell you what, he does have power over the mind and the conscience. And when he stood up and said, let them which are without sin cast the first stone, each one of them from the oldest to the youngest were convicted. Now, it's interesting that the oldest left first. Why do you think their list was longer? Right? In fact, Jesus quotes from the Old Testament law in Deuteronomy chapter 17, 6. Listen to what it says. At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, shall, he shall not be put to death. So, so here we have a situation where more than two or more than one have come and accused this woman. But then it says this in, in Deuteronomy 17, 7. The hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to, be put, to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people, so that thou shalt put the evil away from among you. So here's the law. If you come and accuse somebody and it's backed up by witnesses, you and your witnesses have to do the killing what it says and so jesus says those of you who are adequate witnesses go ahead pick up the first stone you know what it shows it shows that those people were all worthy of death all of them worthy of death and their conscience smote them as they recognize that jesus does an amazing thing here he does not justify the woman's actions, neither does he deny her guilt. He upholds the law. He puts the law back into their hands. At this point, Jesus in some way exposes their own hypocrisy and their weakness, both to condemn and both, he, they cannot justify her either. Their hypocrisy is unmasked. They, recognizing their own guilt and place of condemnation, slink away one by one. However, there's one left, 
who did not try to hide her guilt or shame by walking away. She stayed with Jesus. If she wanted to hide her guilt and shame, she could have left. No one kept her there. No one was stoning her. However, she stays. Every Pharisee, and we've seen this time and time again, time and time again in in Jesus' life in, in the book of John, Jesus extends the offer of life to the Pharisees time and time again. But what do they do? They slink away in their own sin trying to deal with it themselves. And they condemn themselves by running away from life. When confronted with their own sin and shortcoming, they walk away from the one who could give the once for all answer to their sin. Jesus, however, takes her sin on his shoulders, offers freedom, offers new life, a transformed life that would not have adultery in it. It has the law of faithfulness and fidelity written on her heart. I don't know anything about this woman, but I doubt in my understanding of the way God works that she went out desiring to be adulterous. Right? There was a transformation that takes place in the heart of that person who is covered by Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing here. So then I, I, I come to this part, and this will be the end. What, what are we to do? What is our response to these truths? I'll say this, number one, it is not for me to condemn. The word condemn means to damn, right? Now, it's interesting. If you go through the Bible to that passage of Scripture that says, Judge not, lest you be judged. You know that passage? That a person would love to bring out when you point out sin. If you read the rest of that chapter, it says, hey, mark those that do evil and get away from him. What is that? That's called making a judgment. This is right. This is wrong. That's sinful. This is not. I will stay away from that which is sinful, and I will cleave to that which is right. You're allowed to judge in that regard, but you are not allowed to condemn. Only God can condemn. Only God can justify. So I will say this. It is not for me to condemn. Could I have cast the first stone? Could I stand in the place of a righteous judge? Have I kept the law? Have I never lusted? The answer is, he has no right to be God. I have no right to stand in a place of condemnation. However, that must be followed up with point number two. It is not for me to condone. I cannot be okay with adultery and just say, well, God loves you. Right? Did I pay the penalty for sin? If I didn't pay the penalty for sin, I must hate adultery. I cannot be okay with it. Can I reestablish righteousness in a person's life? Am I able to die for the adultery of another? Can I pay that price? The answer is no. I cannot condone it either. By the way, it is not for me to ignore. I can't say, well, you know, it's not me or them. It's not then or now. I must view adultery as God does. I must hate it. I must forbid it in my own life, in my counsel, in my home. I must forbid it. I must separate from it. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it is reported among you that a man has taken his father's wife and you're proud about it. You're puffed up. I would rather that you mourn that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. For for even though I'm not there, but I'm present, my spirit have judged already. He is wrong. He needs to get out. Listen, it says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit might be saved into the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, your glorying is not good. Know ye not? That a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump. As ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. What is he saying? He's saying you can't ignore this. You can't act like it's not happening. You can't turn a blind eye. God hates it. You have no right to condemn anybody. You are not the righteous judge. But you can't condone it because you're not willing to pay for it. And you can't. Don't you dare ignore it. It will absolutely turn the church away from Christ. So then what are we to do? What are we to do? What can we do? 
We can do the same thing that the Pharisees did, but in a much different way. Do you realize what they did? What did, the, what did the Pharisees inadvertently do? They took a person in their sin right to Jesus Christ. Now, they weren't taking so she would find Jesus Christ as her Savior, but what happened? What happened? What are we to do in this kind of a situation? We are to bring those we love to Christ. And that would be anybody, hopefully. I'm not saying that just those who you love. If you know of sin, you can't condemn it. You're a sinner. You can't condone it. You can't pay for it, but you can take them to Jesus Christ. The one who can set them free. The one who can remove their shame. The one who can take the penalty of their sin. Maybe comparing that to the Pharisees is not good, but what about those four friends who had a paralytic friend? What did they do? They, they recognized the need of their friend, and they said, we must take him to Jesus, but we can't. There's too many people in the house. So they, they carried a man upstairs, ripped off a roof, and lowered him at Jesus' feet. That's how passionate they were about getting their friend to Christ. If we are confronted with the sin of adultery, or you plug any sin in there that you know about that is damaging somebody that you know and love, what should you do? It's not for me to judge. It's a cop-out. If you love that person, take them to Christ. Man, read that passage out of Isaiah 61. Oh, I want that for them. That their hearts would be bound up. That their mourning would be turned to gladness. That their shame would be turned into a trophy of God's grace. And only Christ can do that. It is amazing to think of the difference for this woman, how her day started versus the way it ended. It started with sinful intent. It, it, it continued being caught in sin and the shame and the guilt of being publicly uh, humiliated uh, for this sin, having death put over her head. And standing there in this great shame and in the face of death, she found life. She found freedom she found salvation. She found a Savior. By the way, this is you, right? Remember? You're that woman. You say, well, I've never committed adultery. I doubt that highly. Adultery takes place in the heart. Let's just be honest. As we stand there, we have a choice. Will we run to Christ or will we try to hide our shame in a nice suit and tie and slink out the door? It brings such verses like Romans 8.28 into beautiful context. This woman's day started out the worst of her life and ended the best ever. Romans 8.28, how's it go? And we know that all things work together for good. What a God we have who can take such a horrible day and make it into life. Remember, remember the testimony of Joseph? When he finally got all his brothers in front of him and he was the ruler of the known world at the time, he said these words, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. I love the story. I love the story because of who our Savior is. So let me read these words to you from Romans chapter 2. And take it to heart. Romans chapter 1 is all about the downward spiral of man in sin. And it is talking about you. It's not talking about some people out there. It's talking about your heart. Romans 1 is an indictment against you. You are the man. You are the sinner. And so it comes to verse 1 of Romans 2 and it says... Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man. You're guilty, especially if you judge another, whosoever thou art that judges. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest dost the same thing. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man? 
that judgest them which do such thing, things, and dost the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Who are you, high church member? To stand in a place of judgment. You judge yourself when the Pharisees judge themselves by bringing a sinner to Jesus. Right? But then there is probably what has become for me one of the most beautiful verses in Scripture. Romans 2 and chapter 4. And it's said in a negative way, but I love the positive of it. It says this, or despi- speaking to the hypocrite, it says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God what leadeth thee to repentance. How many times in your life have you not received the stones for your sin? And how many times would you like the Pharisees just walk out? having received grace and mercy, or as this verse says, forbearance and long-suffering. Do you not realize that the goodness of God in your life should bring you to a point of repentance? I tell you, even studying this chapter was the goodness of God that, that, that pricked my conscience and said, you must repent. You must be right with God. You must deal with issues of the heart. And it is the goodness of God. It, men and women, if you're faithful in your marriage, praise God. The goodness of God should lead you to what? Being right with God. Not standing in a place of judgment. Well, I haven't committed adultery. No, you should say, God, thank you that, that the act hasn't happened, but you know my heart. And you know I'm an adulterer. Oh God, forgive me. Restore me to a right relationship with you. That's our response. How do I treasure the holiness of God instead of becoming a hypocrite? How do I let the holiness of God lead me into repentance? I do it by recognizing the grace and mercy of God in my own life, by valuing this grace by seeking this grace for others in the face of Jesus Christ. I love this passage. And I love it for these reasons. Righteousness and holiness are upheld. Grace and mercy are poured out. Righteousness is restored. It is given to her. The cross is lifted up and Christ is magnified. What a beautiful Savior we have. Let's pray. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I would plead with you this morning. If you are sitting here shrouded by the shame of your sin, you must come to Christ. If you are mourning because of your wickedness, come to Christ. If you are shackled in addiction, If you are shackled to your sin, come find freedom in Christ. He won't excuse it. He won't deny it. But he'll take it. And he will give to you what he earned, which is freedom and glory and joy and righteousness. Believer, Do you find yourself standing with the Pharisees, oftentimes condemning those around you? Oh, that you would see the truth of our Lord. That you would allow the goodness of God in your life to bring you to a point of repentance. And that you would seek then to restore those who are hurting to a loving Savior. Our Heavenly Father, you know that each one of us are adulterers. That we have allowed our hearts to seek after other gods. That our love has gone after other lovers and not after you. Lord, for those who have been involved in the physical act of adultery, we thank you that for all of us today, you offer forgiveness because you took our sin on the cross. You suffered the punishment of the law. 
and you have condemned that sin. Oh, Lord, may we not be like the Pharisees who run away, but may we be like the woman who stays and receives. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like us to stand together and in response to what the Lord may be doing in your heart, that we sing about our great Savior. And as we sing, pay attention to the words, Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Let's stand together. It's song number 177, Our Great Savior. Sing this as your personal testimony. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends may fail, foes assail. He, my Savior, makes me whole. What are you struggling with this morning on the second? Jesus, what a strength in weakness. Let me hide myself in Him. Tempted, tried, and sometimes failing. He, my strength, my victory wins. out on the last Jesus uh, do now receive him more than all in him I find he hath granted me forgiveness I am his and he God's people said...